The case today is 13-1633, United States v. Jose Rodriguez, and number 13-1657, United States v. Joel Santini-Mendez. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Bonilla. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning, Madam Clerk. Victoria Bonilla, on behalf of Mr. Santini-Mendez. May it please the Court. Mr. Santini-Mendez was convicted on count three of the indictment of possessing a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. He was convicted as an aider and an abetter, not as a co-conspirator. As an aider and abetter, knowledge is extremely important because the mens rea is higher than it is for a vicarious liability standard. It is so high that it is practical certainty. Knowledge equates practical certainty. It's practical certainty that tells us through Vasquez Castro that it is actually actual knowledge. So from Vasquez Castro, we learn that those words, practical certainty, are actual knowledge. And now, from the United States Supreme Court under Rosemont, Justice Kagan has told us that that knowledge has got to be advanced knowledge. Advanced knowledge meaning prior to commencing the criminal activity. And as it's stated in that opinion, it is to give the opportunity for that individual to withdraw from that criminal enterprise, that criminal endeavor. Counsel, is it your position when you say advanced knowledge is required, is it your position that the government would have to prove that before your client entered the vehicle with the co-defendant, that he had knowledge that the co-defendant had the gun? Is that what you mean by advanced knowledge? Yes, Your Honor, because the crime charged, aside from the drug activity that is not in question in this appeal, is the use of the firearm in furtherance of a drug activity. Why, in that case, why wouldn't it suffice if, as they are riding in the vehicle together, a jury could conclude that your client knew that the co-defendant had the gun in his possession? Why wouldn't that knowledge meet the element of the crime? Knowledge can be established as soon as the individuals enter into a vehicle if there had been evidence presented to the jury that Mr. Santini Mendez knew that the co-defendant was carrying a firearm. Well, it's a circumstantial case. They're in close proximity. They're in the vehicle together. The co-defendant has a very large gun under his shirt, which may have been visible. Typically, often it is a circumstantial case like this. But in order to even prove the circumstantial case, Your Honor, there has to be some evidence presented to the jury, not speculation that he may have seen the weapon, but evidence that he saw it or somehow knew that it was there. And there's nothing in this case that was presented. Why would that be enough? Let's assume that they knew, that Santini knew the gun was there. I had thought that that would show knowledge of the gun, but it wouldn't necessarily show that the gun was therefore in furtherance of Santini's trafficking offense. Well, that goes to the third element, which would be the finding. Can you speak about that? Yes, Your Honor. It refers to nexus. There has to be a nexus between the drug activity and the use of that firearm to further, to promote, to enhance, to aid that drug activity. We don't have that evidence here. And as this Court has said many occasions, in furtherance of language is not an inelastic term. So this Court has instructed we need to look at subjective facts and we need to look at objective facts. In this instance, in this case, I suggest to this Court there are no subjective facts that establish that Mr. Santini Mendez possessed, had the knowledge to possess that firearm and the knowledge to possess it with the intent to further the criminal activity. You have to look at that nexus, in this case, through the objective standards that 
the government may present to you or that were presented at trial. Here, there are no observations that there was a drug transaction. There is no evidence that that drug was carried when Mr. Santini Mendez purchased his drugs. There is no evidence that the gun is going to be carried or would have been carried in some future crime when Mr. Santini Mendez would sell his drugs. There is no evidence. Counsel, if I understand the situation, I mean, the charge is possession with intent to distribute. As they are driving in that vehicle with drugs on their person, with small baggies, with cash, which is often present when folks are engaged in drug trafficking, I mean, the notion is that the gun, and this is often the case, may be used protectively. Drug trafficking is a dangerous business. We have said in many of our cases that it's commonplace for those who are engaged in drug trafficking, in this case possession with intent to distribute, will have a gun on the person of those involved for protective purposes. And if it's there for that protective purpose, why wouldn't that be in furtherance of the drug trafficking? We have to be very careful. This court has also said that mere presence is insufficient. And we certainly don't want to be confusing terms of vicarious liability with aiders and abettors. We have to make very, very clear two very different standards. Whereas an aider and abettor, the standard is much higher as to the knowledge element and as to the intent that's going to happen with that gun. You need to know that there was a firearm. There's no evidence presented that there was. You need to know that that firearm has some nexus. You were going to use it with that drug activity. There is no evidence of that. In all of the cases where this court has found such a nexus, it is based on the objective. There's a drug transaction. There's wiretaps. There's meats. There's a drug buy set up where police come in. And other cases, warrants, searches of homes. Do we know from the record why they were in the car together? No, Your Honor. Do we know where they were going to? No, Your Honor. We know they're going to a hardware store. They're at a hardware store. Or they were leaving a hardware. This is a traffic stop. This vehicle, as I understand from the record, was stopped because it had dark tinted windows. And the officers who stopped the vehicle believed that the tint on the windows was too dark. That is the subject of the stop. That's why this car is stopped. Not because they made any observations or anybody called and said, hey, there's drug dealers in this car. There is no indicia, no evidence other than a traffic stop where one individual admits to the police that he has bought these drugs, which, by the way, are sham drugs, and they total 10.2 grams of sham cocaine. And on his person, he had $1,029. This is not our typical case where we have thousands of dollars worth of drugs, where we have various vehicles, where there's buys being done, and they're being observed, and people are co-conspirators. This is not that case. Counsel, it really sounds like you're now making an argument that there was insufficient evidence to prove the drug trafficking offense, to prove that there was possession with intent to distribute. And obviously, if that's the case, then there would be insufficient evidence to prove that a gun was being used in furtherance of the underlying crime. Isn't that what you're really arguing? That has been the argument all along, Your Honor, yes. I thought your argument could succeed even if you conceded that your client possessed the drugs, the sham drugs, and therefore his representations that he was engaged with intent to distribute. Even if we assume that crime, I thought the issue was, notwithstanding that, to charge him with using the gun in furtherance of it would require your client to have had some knowledge that the person carrying the gun intended that gun to aid the trafficking. That is correct, Your Honor. We're not questioning at all the client's admissions to drug or that conviction. It is, as I started, he was convicted of using that firearm, of possession of that firearm, of furtherance of a drug activity. That is what we challenge here. And I'm giving the court to consider that this is an aider and abetter to note the difference between aiders and abetters and vicarious liability. Because in the end, as this court has said, mere presence is not enough. 
you need we need to look at all of the standards the facts the specific facts from which a reasonable juror could reach these conclusions that yes he knew there was a weapon and yes he was using that weapon to further his criminal activity and i suggest to this court that the evidence in this case is totally lacking to form the knowledge to form the nexus between the the drugs and the gun it's it's simply not there especially when you compare it to all the cases where you do find it and that's very typical in the conspiracy cases your honor not either of theirs thank you Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Attorney Michael Hasse, and I represent Jose Luis Rodriguez Martinez. He was the gentleman with the gun on his person. And his co-defendant, unbeknownst to him, had some fake drugs in his possession, some cut for drugs commonly. People will take cut and mix it with cocaine to stretch it. But certainly cut is not worth anything. That's why they mix it with the cocaine, because cocaine is quite valuable. And the drugs in the cuts makes it spread out to more users and give them more doses to sell on the street. So essentially the cut is not worth anything. It's certainly not worth carrying a gun around to protect. They could always stop at the next store. I think they sell the stuff at health food stores. It's nothing that would have any impetus to have a gun to protect. There's no knowledge. There's no scienter. There's no advanced mens rea that Mr. Rodriguez Martinez had with regard to the drugs secreted in his buddy's pocket. It's pure speculation what the nexus between the drugs and the guns were. Who knows? But certainly Mr. Rodriguez did not know that his co-defendant Santini had this drugs from anything that's apparent on the record. Maybe they were going to trade the guns, the guns for some cocaine, mix it up and do it. But there's nothing that we can put together as a crime before this court. I think that the co-appellant quite nicely brought in Rosemond. And the Rosemond case seems to bring that this thing in my client's case is kind of the corollary of that. There's no knowledge of the guns in Rosemond. Well, there's no knowledge of the drugs in Mr. Rodriguez's case. The only thing is that just on Rosemond, just so I understand how it fits into this, is Judge Lopez was asking the prior counsel why Rosemond has much to do with this case. Because in Rosemond you had a person going to a scene at which I think a gun then appears. And one of the co-defendants unbeknownst, and I think they don't even know which co-defendant had it. But here they're together in the car, one with a gun, one with drugs. So if they each had knowledge of the other being there, the question of with a gun and with drugs, the question of advanced knowledge wouldn't seem to be particularly relevant. You could just, couldn't you infer from the presence of one with the other? Well, I don't think you can, anything, you can't infer. So say why not? You can't infer possession from something that's in somebody else's pocket. That even if you're in a car or something like that, it could be exposed, looked at as non-exclusive possession. But there has to be some circumstance or inference that shows that you knew about it. You were doing something that was obviously attuned to playing with the drugs. But there's nothing here. You know, a Glock isn't a gun that's, you have to have a big bulge as if somebody's pregnant when they're carrying around a Glock. A Glock is a fairly compact police weapon, and you see it on most of the courthouse officers. And it's something that could be slipped into your belt and not seen. I mean, you know. What was the evidence about the size of the magazine? Well, there was a couple extra bullets in the magazine. But just a couple extra bullets isn't a huge protrusion. Is this a magazine that tucks inside the handle? It slides and is concealed inside the handle. So, I mean, it's not like somebody's carrying around an AK-47 or some assault weapon. It's a pistol. It's an automatic pistol. It's a fairly compact size. 
but certainly even more of a compact size is the drugs secreted in somebody's pocket. And I just think that there's not enough. Where were the, there's a reference in the record to baggies that are often used. Those were also in the stamp size baggies. Okay, and where were they found? In his pocket as well. Okay, and the $1,000 plus of cash, where was that? Also in the pocket. So there's nothing to indicate that my client had any knowledge of that. What about the uh, the first way in which your client reacted as soon as they were stopped? The, the government described what's in the record, his, his odd behavior of immediately absenting himself in the vehicle, walking over to a wall, uh, pulling out his cell phone, nervously well, I talking about I mean, there, there's something very odd about his behavior in the immediate aftermath of the of the stop. One could call that odd or one could call that normal if a person, if a police officer pulls over a couple guys in a car, tinted windows, maybe who knows what else was going on, maybe they had some music. Um, it's a place where somebody naturally doesn't want to hang out. And he walked down the street and was using his telephone. I mean, I, nowadays people using, not using their telephone is somewhat odd. Um, if you look at people sit, sitting around in the coffee shop, everybody seems to be on their telephone. You see somebody looking around and and looking for somebody else, that's pretty odd. So, I mean, I don't think that really makes a circumstance that is truly odd. What's the relationship? They're, they're brothers-in-law, is that correct? That's they're, correct. They're related, is that correct? Right, yeah, but I, they, a relationship like that shouldn't create a, a you know, coexistence in the possession of each things in each other's pockets. Um, two things has to be shown. You know, what, when, you say, when you say the magazine had two extra bullets, wh how many bullets does a typical magazine have? This one had 24, and the government refers to it as an extended magazine. So t tell me what you know about the magazine. Um, the, the magazine that comes with the gun has a, has a, a um, I'm, getting to, I'm not, I haven't looked exactly the number of bullets, I know, but this one could contain more, I mean, but it doesn't make the gun huge, much more bigger than a, than a normal gun from the pictures I saw on the evidence. So you're just going off the, the pictures? Yes, I'm going off what, what, what I saw in the file, yes. Yeah. Just to understand your argument, even if uh, your client had knowledge of the gun and was aware of it. Well, obviously my client... I'm, I'm sorry, if your client had knowledge, yeah. uh, if, if the other client, uh, the other defendant had knowledge of the gun, you're still claiming that there's no nexus Right, between that gun and the drug crime, so I, it doesn't. Yes. Let's assume the gun was large. Well, there, there, then there's nothing for my client to show that he knew of the the, the drugs. He, you know, he, well, let's assume your client knew of the drugs too. So let's say both knew. In that instance, well, it would be a would, different. It would be a different case then. Well, 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 why? I thought you would still have no evidence that either one was in furthering using the gun in furtherance of the drugs, or is it your view that as long as both of them knew about what the other one possessed, then the charge of in furtherance would have a sufficient basis? Well, yes and no. There's, if, if there, are no there are no drugs here to begin with. I mean, I know, well, the, I know the, sham, the, the sham, sham drugs, drugs. Can, be, can be used, certainly to be, even if they, they can be used as drugs in terms of reserve strings, strings. Uh, stings in other cases, um, but I think there's nothing in the record. I mean, to show possession and f furtherance. Because well, so it seems, I mean, the logic of your argument seems to be that in order to prove the sort of in furtherance element, there has to be some evidence that the gun is actually being used in some way. That it's that it's perhaps brandish, which is actually a can be a distinct element in these in these uh, in these cases. Right. That seems to be the, if somebody is found simply with the gun on their person, uh, even though a drug transaction is taking place, in your view, that's not enough. Just mere ha having it on your person from right. the course of a drug transaction is not enough. There has to be some evidence that it was actually used in some way to further the transaction. Is, some is, that, is that your position? Some nexus, yes. I'm sorry. Some there has to be some nexus between the gun and the and the drug just, transaction. So do you, you, there's two possible meanings of that. One would be you actually have to display the gun in some direct way. The other would be <clears throat> that you have to have the gun with you 
for the purpose of assisting in the trafficking maybe because you think you will use it if it's needed to be in defense or something those are two very different ideas which of them is the position or is it both or either one is suffices I think either one would suffice and the contention is here you have neither all you have is just the possession of the gun itself possession of the gun and my guy pled guilty to that the drugs he had no knowledge about there's nothing in the record no circumstance no inference no advanced knowledge no advanced mens rea nothing that we can prove from the record things that may have happened in the past because their brother-in-law is rank speculation but if you read the case and if you look at the activities and even when counsel says was there any other reason why you stopped this car no that's clearly on the record and it was it was just a stop on for the window violation and these other things came out and the drugs were found here the gun was found there but there's no way to tie my client together with the drugs in order to prove that he used his gun in furtherance of that drug crime does the quantity of the drugs on the co-defendant's person is that suppose he had a suppose he had a much larger quantity of drugs on his person sounds to me like you your argument would still be the same is that correct there would be no way to connect your client to the co-defendant in terms of his knowledge of the in this case the much larger quantity of drugs you would still say there's not enough evidence to show that he had knowledge of that much larger quantity of drugs would that be your position that'd be my position especially under the circumstances of this particular stop I mean it could even it could even work with a trunk load of pure cocaine I mean there still is no connection when they stop him for the dark windows and and find that as an after aftermath there's nothing to connect the passenger to it it's a non-exclusive possession case with no circumstance or inference to prove that the that the mr. Rodriguez had any connection or knowledge of it thank you thank you so much good morning assistant United States Attorney Denise Longo for the appellee in this case as to mr. Santini's argument it is correct that or we must point out that he admitted the drug trafficking crime he admitted the evidence in the record is that he admitted after being arrested that he possessed the sham cocaine for the purpose of distribution that he had gone and purchased it at a public housing project and that he intended to distribute it and so basically as to the drug trafficking crime he admits that he was engaged in that drug trafficking crime so as to his liability under the 924 C for count three it comes from the fact that he was as developed in the record sitting in this vehicle or the driver and or controller of this vehicle where the passenger was carrying this gun the gun it can I just ask you suppose he was at his home just sitting at his home he has the same amount of drugs in his pocket and the doorbell rings and the person with the gun is at the door at that moment when the person walks in with the gun is there sufficient evidence to show that the gun is in furtherance of a trafficking crime well your honor in the question has to do with knowledge in this case in particular the knowledge is developed through the conduct of the individuals in in other cases we've had we've had the same issue with boat captains it's more akin to I think that into the situation where the boat captain is in the in in the boat and they have drugs and they have guns and they're all secreted in secret compartments and the court has held and under 924 C the mere presence of the gun in that boat which is a vehicle is in furtherance of the drug trafficking crime because of the nature of the gun we understand that that those and this was how it was presented to the jury at trial just going back to my hypothetical though so what in the in the house the same thing we have had the cases in the house is the same thing we I can't bring up the case but there was a case where the where the gun was secreted with weapons just on my hypothetical because I want to get it as close as I can to the car situation to see why it's different but all the person has is he has drugs same kind of drugs that Santini has claimed to have here in his pocket he's in his house 
the doorbell rings, the person then is let in, it's his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law has a gun on him, same size gun under his uh, belt. At that moment, is there sufficient evidence to say that the gun is in furtherance of the trafficking? Well, we would argue that maybe not in the moment that he comes in, but let's say that he comes in and I see him carrying this weapon and we sit down and decide to get together in a vehicle and start driving. At that point, yes, because Mr. Santini okay. takes Mr. Rodriguez Martinez into his vehicle and drives with Mr. Rodriguez Martinez in the vehicle with him. And what was presented to the jury and the evidence, it is correct that it is circumstantial, but it's patently clear that this is a weapon that was the size of a weapon that, it, that uh, the knowledge by Mr. Santini of the presence of the weapon in the car was evident, not only because of the so size wh of the why, weapon. Why do you say that? Why was it so evident? Not only because of the, the size of the weapon, but because of the conduct of the two individuals. The, 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 uh, the evidence presented at trial was that the police officers did this normal traffic stop, and when they approached the vehicles, first Mr. Rodriguez Martinez, who is the passenger, gets out of the vehicle, which the agents understand and react to as normally. Usually you do a traffic stop, the police officer is going to intervene with the driver. There really is no reason for the passenger to react because well, it's a have, traffic if stop. If you're carrying an illegal gun, they might have to it, <laughs> be a little bit concerned about the stop. So it, clearly that, that was part of what was presented to the jury because then when he gets out of the vehicle, Mr. Rodriguez Martinez gets out of the vehicle, he is nervous in his demeanor. But, but how does that show anything about the the knowledge of the drugs. Well, the, the other thing is that the record also reflects that Mr. Santini Mendes, Mr. Santini Mendes also, sua sponte by himself, got out of the vehicle, not at the request of the police officer, but both. So they both engaged in the same behavior of trying to separate themselves from the vehicle and from each other. So that's what the totality of the circumstances in this case is. This is a case, it is correct, it was a traffic stop. This was, there was no prior uh, intelligence as to the fact that these individuals are involved in drug trafficking. It is a traffic stop where the agents respond to the facts as they have in front of them. And that was what was presented to the jury for the jury to make a reasonable analysis as to whether or not the behavior and conduct of these individuals pointed to the fact that they were acting in concerted action. In this case in particular, we argue as to Mr. Santini Mendez, one, that he admitted that he was engaged in drug trafficking, so he admits the underlying offense. And then as to the 924C, that the nature of the gun and the behavior of Mr. Rodriguez Martinez and Mr. Santini Mendez himself at the time of the traffic stop foretells the fact that they have knowledge of each other's conduct. Mr. Rodriguez Martinez, for example, he steps out of the vehicle and is trying to separate himself. The indication of the, of the jury was that he was limping or acting in a way as to try to conceal the weapon. The evidence, the, the weapon itself is presented in, in um, I think that there, there's a PowerPoint that was presented to the jury that is in the record. Is, is a weapon with an extended magazine. It's not the normal magazine that comes with the weapon. It's a larger magazine. It's a 30-bullet magazine that had 24 bullets. So it really is a more cumbersome item to carry. It is not an easily concealable uh, weapon. So it, it sticks out below the, the bottom of the handle It of the sticks gun. out beyond the handle. That's correct. Um, so it, it's and it's cumbersome. Just so I understand, is is the key to your to the inference that you're saying uh, would suggest that they were working jointly uh, in some way that he was aware of the gun being on uh, Rodriguez's person when Rodriguez entered the car. The the, the position and the inference is that is that mis when Mr. Rodriguez was in the car. No, I know that. But is it, you said earlier when I was asking that they went into the car together, mm -hmm. and I guess I could understand that if the, if the theory is that, you know, they're jointly walking to the car together, one has drugs, he knows the guy walking to the car has a gun with him. Is that crucial to the government's case? It is crucial to the government's case. So if we didn't think that the record showed that there was evidence that he would have known uh, Rodriguez had the gun when he entered the car, is there a sufficient inference that we can draw from the fact that once in the car it might have been possible to see while he's sitting there the gun extended? We, we, would, we would argue, one, that, well, he get into the car, but the other thing is that from the evidence presented, uh, they made admissions or indicated that they had been at the hardware store and that they had gone together to the hardware store and were coming out of the hardware store. There were no bags recovered from the hardware store, so that that... that was presented as evidence to the fact that they were being less than, than truthful. 
it goes together with the fact that it was presented to the jury that when Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez got out of the vehicle, he sort of waved and said goodbye. He pretended he was, oh, let me take advantage of the traffic stop to leave. But also it was presented to the jury in the photos and exhibits 3, 4, and 8 was that this traffic stop was 60 feet from the parking lot from where they were exiting. So it wouldn't make any sense for an individual that's leaving the hardware store where we went to buy some items and then coming back and as soon as there's a traffic stop, I get out and pretend to, to leave and get out. So it is the totality of, of the circumstances as they came out that create the, the sufficient information or circumstantial evidence for, the, for a reasonable fact finder to, to develop the, 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 that they had knowledge of each other's activities. How did the uh, government um, present the case in terms of where the Glock uh, likely was while Rodriguez was still in the car, tucked into his trousers, or did you get into that? We, we didn't get into the, the fact as to where it was while in, while in the vehicle because we did not have any direct evidence of that. So how did you make the constructive possession argument if you didn't know where it was in the vehicle? Well, the constructive possession argument, we made it based on, on showing it to the jury and its cumbersome nature and the fact that when he stepped out of the vehicle, he did have it secreted in his in his. Person. So the theory was that then that it was tucked into his trousers while he was in the car. Or that it would have been in his person. And because of the close proximity, this is a Honda Accord. It's a small vehicle. And Mr. Santini Mendez himself is a large individual. Um, so they, they were, you know, elbow to elbow with each other. And Mr. Rodriguez Martinez was carrying this large weapon with him, either secreted in his, well, the argument was that it would have been very difficult for him to actually have it concealed while he was sitting because of the nature of the gun, so that really he would have had to have it, it on would, him. Because it would stick up or, or just that you, you wouldn't expect someone to to have it tucked Both. in? Both. We wouldn't, that you wouldn't because of the nature okay, of it. Okay, so because if it's not tucked size. in, um, what did the defense say about whether it might have been in the back seat? Um, it, I don't think that it was argued to that effect that after my review of the, of the record. They under didn't the seat, argue it. under the front seat, anything? The, the, it wasn't presented or argued in that way because it, it was admitted that, that he had it on his person when he came out of the vehicle and that he was trying to secret it in his person. Yes, but I'm just trying to understand the, the constructive possession argument, that's all. Well, the constructive possession by, for Mr. Santinez, the argument was that the size of, and, and nature, but also the nature of the gun. I think what was shown to the jury was that this is also not a weapon that is for personal security because it is a large weapon. No, no I know, but for, with respect to constructive procession, you have to show dominion and control on the part of the driver, Santini. And if the car's under the, if the gun is under the front seat and he doesn't know about it, then it makes it a tougher case. That that is correct. But in this case, the way that it was presented is that Mr. Santini was the driver of the vehicle and was the person in control of the vehicle. It was actually a vehicle that was not owned by either of the defendants. Um, so it was presented as that Mr. Santini as owner of the vehicle and the person uh, with presumed control and possession, the, also the close proximity, because no matter where it would have been, it would have been within his reach and control in this, you know, if it's in the front area of this Honda Accord where they're both riding. And evidently, Mr. Rodriguez Martinez had to have had it in his person in order to step out with it concealed in his well, person. If um if uh, the uh, the co-defendant uh, uh, was concerned about being found uh, with a gun on his possession, uh, if the gun was so was someplace else in the car, in the back seat, under the front seat, it would seem unlikely that when he absents himself from the car that he would grab the gun from the back seat or from under the front seat and put it on his person. Uh, and then get out of the vehicle. I mean, that that would be very counterproductive from his point of view, would it not? I mean, that that suggests, arguably, that he had it on his person the whole time. The whole time, and and the the other thing is that it suggests that 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 they they would have had to know that it was there. The presentation to the jury was the conduct of both defendants at the same time at the moment of the traffic stop. What did it? convey to the officers because it was also in, in, in the testimony of the officers that it was a totality of the circumstance. One of one of the, the points is that the officer says that when he was um, perceiving Mr. Rodriguez Martinez, he was standing behind the vehicle surveying both defendants and he sees the conduct and reacts. So well, a lot just, of it has to do... Could you 
Just on the conduct itself, so I understand, the conduct that you are suggesting shows a nexus between the drugs and the gun is that the two passengers, each of which was in possession of an illegal contraband, exited the vehicle? They both stepped out of the vehicle. Once the traffic stop stopped... And that's the evidence of the nexus between the two things? Well, because we argue that it is the evidence of consciousness of guilt. But the consciousness of the guilt is of their contraband, I would think. Why is that evidence of consciousness of guilt of a joint enterprise of any kind? I don't follow that. Because we would argue that Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez, when there's a traffic stop, you know, they argue to the jury, when the traffic stop occurs, the police officer is going to intervene with the driver exclusively. The only thing is that, and then the important thing is that Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez knows that Mr. Santini has drugs in his pockets and has to know and perceive that if he gets arrested, then everybody's getting arrested and they're going to find my gun. So that that consciousness, that forethought of the fact that they're intervening with him and he only has cash, $1,000 in cash and drugs, which is what, you know, he's using for his drug trafficking, but if he gets arrested, then the whole car gets searched and everybody gets searched and my gun gets found. So that's why they're both attempting to physically remove themselves from each other so that they can remove one item away from the other. And it is that totality of the conduct that's being presented. It was fairly clear from the agent's testimony that what they reacted to was to Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez's nervousness, that they were not going to intervene with him until he gets out of the car and pretends to leave and goes and stands by the corner. The jury had an opportunity to see the photos of the location. This is a rural location. There would be no reason for Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez to get out of the car and step in that area. The photo itself shows that it was just bushes and there was like a creek. So he wouldn't go anywhere at the place that he chose to get out of the car. How was the gun detected by the officers? I don't get the impression that when Mr. Rodriguez stepped out of the vehicle that the gun was immediately apparent to the officers. Isn't that correct? That is correct. What they indicated is that when they saw him that he was sort of limping, that he was trying to conceal the weapon. They both were wearing T-shirts and there were photos shown to the jury. They had T-shirts and I think they both had shorts. And he said that he was limping and trying to conceal with the T-shirt the gun in his person so that there was a weird gate that sort of projected. And then it just fell to the ground. Is that correct? The gun just fell to the ground? The testimony is no, it didn't fall to the ground. The second officer, Officer Abreu, patted him down and then took it and put it in the floor. And that's when the officer that was testifying sees it because he sees the actual gun for the first time when the other agent puts it in the floor. That's what the record is. So during the pat-down phase, the officer did not see the gun? Well, they approached him. They turned him around. Remember, he was in a weird gate. They turned him around and then they do an immediate pat-down, pick it up and put it in the floor. I mean, it's a matter of seconds. It's an immediate process. The police officer is the one who actually removes the gun and puts it on the floor? But there were two police officers. There was Officer Melendez who testified, who was the one that was intervening with Santini, speaks to him. Santini had gotten out of the car and he said, okay, go get the papers because Santini said it's not my car. I don't know. I don't have the papers. And while Mr. Santini is looking for the papers, that's when the police officer removes himself behind the vehicle and starts looking and sees Rodriguez Martinez. So then they go towards him. And he goes with his partner, Abreu. There's testimony on the record that Melendez looks at Abreu and says, you know, do you see what I'm seeing? And then they both approach him. So the pat-down is conducted by two officers sort of at the same time. Officer Melendez moves him and Abreu does the pat-down and then finds and puts. So the officer that testified, Melendez, was not the one who removed the weapon. Just so I get it, the only way the gun was identified was through the pat-down? Yeah, that's the only time that it was seen, physically seen. Well, that's not helpful to the government's position that the gun must have been apparent to Mr. Santini if the officers themselves could not see the gun on Mr. Rodriguez's person absent a pat-down. It's different when you're sitting down than when you're standing up and using a T-shirt to try and conceal something that you have secreted in your waistband. I mean, it was argued Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez would have been sitting in the car, would not have had the same opportunity to use the T-shirt to conceal the gun. Thank you.
to use the large T-shirt around him to conceal it. So that was presented to the jury. And like I said, there were photos shown of what they were wearing that day to the jury. And, you know, it was that behavior that gave them the marks. The agent testified that they reacted to the behavior. So it is that consciousness of guilt that we believe was the subjective evidence in this case. So Santini gave a statement where he said where he bought what he thought was cocaine? That's correct. Does he say anything about when he picked up his brother-in-law? How long between the time that he purchased the drugs and they were stopped? Any of that? There is no record in, there's no evidence in the record as to when he picked up the guns. I mean the cocaine. We don't have a time span as to how long it had been in his possession. And there's an indication that they went to the hardware store together. And that, or like there are allegations that they went to the hardware store together and they were coming out of the hardware store together. And that was one of the things that was presented to the jury, that it is unusual for you to walk with that type of weapon, you know, into a hardware store. Why would you be carrying that in a hardware store run? That it would have been unusual. And that the nature of the gun itself is what leads to the fact that it was there in furtherance of the drug trafficking crime. As stated and as shown in the record, Mr. Santini had the drugs. He had what he thought was cocaine, at least 10 grams. He had 10 glassine bags that would match the ability to make that into substances for distribution, which he indicated he wanted to distribute. And then Mr. Rodriguez-Martinez had this weapon, which was a Glock with an extended magazine, 24 bullets, fully loaded. When it was recovered, it was loaded. It wasn't being transported like separately. It was being transported ready to fire. So that those facts and the conduct of these individuals at the moment that the traffic stop takes place is what leads to the fact that they were acting in concerted fashion. So it's conceivable, right, that they actually did go into the hardware store. He wasn't carrying the Glock when he was in the hardware store. He actually put it under the front seat of the car. Santini never saw him put it under the front seat of the car. When the traffic stop occurred, Rodriguez says to Santini, I've got a gun. It's under the front seat of the car, even though you didn't know that. Santini says, get the gun and get out of here. That's all conceivable, right? But that's for a jury to decide. We understand that that would be for the jury to decide whether they believe that he would not have known ahead of time due to their behavior. Counsel, do you want to say a brief word about the jury instruction issue? I know that appellants did not raise it here. This odd language in the instruction where the court refers to someone else, perhaps including a co-defendant, that they might have been helping. What could that language possibly mean, someone else? Your Honor, I think that it was drafted with the intent that the jury understand that they didn't have to personally do it, that the other person could be the person carrying, that it has to do with the concept of constructive possession. It was added as a way to put in the aiding and abetting liability. And as we argued in our brief, you know, we understand that it tracks the language of the instructions, the Hornby instructions, with the intent of creating that. It really is to, I think, to convey to the jury the concept that you don't have to possess it. It was aiding and abetting somebody else having it, you know, just not an intent that it would be a third party, but with the knowledge that the jury would have to make a determination as to having some evidence as to who that someone else would be. And in this case, there's only evidence as to these two individuals being. So we do not believe that the language itself would create any confusion in the jury or would not allow it to reach a reasonable determination in the case. Thank you.